Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jeremy has already said, I'm going to be presenting a case series that was done by Vets Vida. So Vets Vida is the new name for RMPRU. I'm sure a lot of you will, might be familiar with RMPRU, which is headed by Professor Madi. So we are now called Vida. So that's our new name. It stands for Vaccines and Infectious Diseases Analytics. Uh, research unit. So I'm going to be talking about the clinical characteristics and histopathology of COVID-19 related pediatric deaths at Barra. So this case series was done at Bida, as I said, but we worked very closely with the PEDS department at Barra in, in doing uh, this and collecting this. Okay, come with my slide. Uh, I'm going to escape and try. Uh, Fakiri, there's a, usually, if you hover your mouse in the bottom left, there's some arrow keys that pop up. Zoom doesn't always otherwise allow you to move. Oh. Uh, bottom left? Bottom left. Nothing here. Oh, okay, there. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so... No problem. So there's, quite, there's quite a lot of noise around. Uh, Is there quite a lot of background noise? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there you Sorry, go. Sorry. I mean, okay, I'm, go ahead. It's yeah. an open no plan office, so I can't really. Okay. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, just as a bit of a background, just to say that you know the coronavirus of 2019 pandemic was caused by SARS-CoV-2, and we know that you know from studies that have been collected that it causes um, asymptomatic infection in a lot of children and some adults, and that even though it does cause mild disease in some children, we know that there's few deaths that occur as a result of this. And then just as a way of example, in the US in July of the 190,000 COVID-19 deaths, only 121 of those were children. And also here at home in, you know, in the first wave um, from around March to July, when we had over a thousand kids admitted to hospital, uh, about 26 of those passed away as a result of COVID-19. So, you know, even though uh, deaths do occur, it's fortunately not a lot of children that, that do die from COVID-19. And there's other, you know, things to worry about when it comes to COVID-19, like the MIS-C, uh, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that clinicians should be aware of and ha should have a high index of suspicion on. But thankfully, even with that, the case fatality risk is quite low. So in children, we know from previous studies that were done, for example, in the PERCH study that was done, that when we identify coronaviruses, uh, endemic coronaviruses in the upper airway, it does not necessarily mean that those are causing the lower respiratory tract infection that has occurred in kids. So when you are attributing causality to, say, severe disease or death with um, uh, respiratory infections, you need to be, you know, you, you kind of need to do more tests for you to say definitely that this is as a result, you know, that the death is as a result of that, uh, of that uh, pathogen. So, and um, pathology, um, auto, uh, autopsies tend to be what is used in adults to, to, you know, to make that decision to say that, you know, we found this organism and we know what this organism does. And then when we see these changes, we can then attribute it to that. So, and in children, we are needing to do that uh, more specifically because we know that, we, you know, it could be co a coincidental find if you find a coronavirus in the airway and then a child demises. So that basically just says why it was important to do, you know, minimally invasive tissue sampling, which I'll explain in, in detail or autopsies in children. In adults, what they did to kind of get those features that were COVID-19 attributed, you know, those lung features, uh, what they did is they did complete uh, diagnostic autopsies and some studies did uh, endoscopic uh, tests. So in the systemic review, uh, they did, they took like 45 um, studies of lung histopathology, all of adults. And what they did is they looked at kind of uh, features that came through as being attributed to causing deaths, uh, or, you know, when they found deaths that were attributed to COVID-19, the features that they say, you know, these lung histopathologic features were seen. So they didn't give percentages, unfortunately, in this uh, systemic review of 
how many times each of these came through, but they just listed kind of the things that, you know, uh, seem to come through often. So diffuse alveolar damage uh, came through in, uh, in a lot of the papers. Hyaline membrane formation was also seen a lot. Uh, vascular congestion with occasional inflammatory cells also seen a lot. Type 2 uh, uh, pneumocyte hyperplasia. And also with some adults, they saw, you know, um, intraalveolar neutrophils that were there and they said they were suggestive of superimposed bacterial bronchopneumonia as to whether or not you know infections bacterial infections uh, are common in patients with COVID-19 it looked when they did some studies that not really when you looked on the whole but it in some studies it looked like with uh, severe critically ill patients who were in ICU that they tended to have uh, superimposed bacterial infections. So enter minimally invasive autopsies. So, you know, this is now at a point where you're now saying, should we be doing, you know, full autopsies on these babies that we swab and find SARS-CoV-2 in order to determine whether they have, uh, they have died of COVID-19 or not? And we know that, you know, besides it being culturally unacceptable. I mean, in, 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 in our setting, whenever you're asking for, for, for autopsies, and I, I must say, I haven't asked for autopsies in adults for a long time, but I know in children, for example, that it's something that's not, um, that's not easily accepted by parents. Parents are always worried about, are you gonna open the child up? What is the baby going to look like, you know, when we need to bury the baby? Will he still look the same? Are things gonna be taken out? Is he, is he gonna be buried, you know, completely full? So those are all cultural things that parents often worry about. And then with the minimally invasive autopsy, the good thing about that is that we can assure parents that, you know, when the baby does get buried, they will be whole. That what we do is we take, you know, um, punch biopsies really, or biopsies really of, you know, small of the liver, of, of the lungs. We take pieces, we usually describe, our counselors are very good and they describe to the parents that, you know, it's as small as rice, you know, the pieces that we take, we take multiple ones that are the size of rice and then we send them off to the lab in order to get answers. So we find that this minimally invasive tissue sampling is more acceptable to, uh, to parents. Um, and, you know, in the previous study that um, this MIDS was started to be done, in, the started to be done in, which was the CHEMS, it's a Child Health Mortality Prevention Surveillance so what CHEMPS is, is a, is a, it's a multinational uh, surveillance program that's been going on for, for some years, and BARA is a site that is, is a South African site for this for the surveillance. What the surveillance aims to do is to determine what the causes of deaths are in um, stillbirths and in children under five. And once, you know, the, and the, the idea is that when we know the causes of these deaths, we are able to then uh, impact on their management and then also then reduce under five mortality. And when it comes to achieving, you know, comparing um, minimally invasive autopsies or tissue sampling with diagnostic autopsies, these studies were done before CHEMS started, and they found that there was a very good concordance between the two. But obviously, this is more with infectious diseases. For example, a baby who had congenital abnormalities would probably be better suited to having a full autopsy to make a diagnosis rather than somebody. But when it comes to infections, for example, you know, the two were quite comparable. So you, we got really good results with myths comparing it to diagnostic autopsy in determining uh, infectious diseases causes of death. So, um, so this is now where, you know, where, where this uh, study with uh, SARS-CoV-2 comes in is that we say, you know, because we are able to determine causes of infections in, in this manner, then we did the same for children uh, last year during the pandemic. So the study took place um, here at Barra, and it, it took place from the 14th of April to the 31st of August, which was around the time that we had the peak of the first wave. And what we did is that we systemically evaluated the cause of death in um, zero, children aged 0 to 14 years. So we didn't include any stillbirths. It was all uh, babies. Uh, under 14 years, um, and these were babies among whom, uh, and children amongst whom SARS-CoV-2 was identified from their respiratory samples by PCR, either anti-mortem or post-mortem. So anti-mortem, what would happen is that at that time, um, 
during each child when they were admitted would have a swap regardless of what their admission was for at that time uh, in the peace ward at barra you got a screening COVID test so everybody got a test in that way and then also if for some reason a baby came in um, as a DOA or demise soon after birth before a cough, uh, a SARS-CoV-2 swap was done before they died, then those babies got a post-mortem nasopharyngeal swap. And these samples were sent to the NHLS. However, for those kids that um, didn't get a swap done, um, sent uh, post-mortem, but agreed to be in our study, then we also did as part of the uh, the minimally invasive autopsy, one of the tests that we do is we swap all the babies. So in that way, we were able to, you know, to ensure that all the babies got a swab, all the babies that died got a swab, and then from those babies, we were also able to then determine which of those tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so how the minimally invasive uh, tissue sampling procedure occurs is that we have research assistants which go to the mortuary and to the wards every morning so that they can identify any babies that have died you know, uh, in the past 24 hours. And then once they have identified the babies, the, the details of the parents are given over to our counselors who do telephonic recorded uh, um, consent uh, request. From the, from the families. And then once this is obtained, then they then arrange for a, a formal sit down with the parents for, um, for a signed consent. And then, so, but based on the telephonic consent, we are able to then do the minimally invasive tissue sampling relatively soon after the baby has demised and then plan uh, to then get a signed consent. So all the, call, the calls are recorded. Um, so, and then what happens is that once we've gotten that consent, then the clinical associate who are very experienced because they've been part of this CHAMS program and doing uh, minimally invasive tissue sampling for some years now, uh, will then go, um, sometimes if they need help, they would go with the clinician, which is uh, in the past year was myself, but they are really experienced. And for the majority of the cases, they were really great and were doing these pretty much on their own. They get there and they would clean the baby and then they would then do swaps, nasal swaps first, clean the baby. And then they would do um, a cardiac puncture to get blood. And then they would also take lung samples, heart samples and uh, liver samples. For those babies that fell under the CHAMS program. So as I said before, a CHAMS program is a multinational one and South Africa has been a site, but in Soweto there are particular areas that you know CHAMS takes patients from. So if the, a baby that had demised and was positive for SARS-CoV-2 fell in the CHAMS program, then as part of the CHAMS, so we will, um, we will then, uh, they will then be in both studies and we would then do a brain sample because that forms part of the CHAMP study, but it didn't form part of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 study that we did. So then they would then take those samples from the babies and then the blood would be sent for HIV testing. It would be sent for bacterial culture. And then we would also do a molecular test on that sample. And the molecular test, there's a panel of um, bacteria and viruses that are on the test that would be done. And then the lung samples, heart and liver would be sent for histopathological examination. And then the lung sample, uh, another part of the lung sample. So they each you know, have a number of different samples that they have to collect and then each each goes to a different place. And then the second lung sample uh, samples would then uh, be sent also for bacterial culture and to the NHLS. And then for, again, a separate uh, panel, which is the respiratory viruses, bacteria, and this panel also in includes uh, TB. And, um, and then, yeah, and then the children, as I've said, that fall under CHAMPS as well would have brain samples done and these would be sent for histopathology. So, at, you know, at the end of this, you have um, uh, parents who have consented and then you've got a MIDS that was done hopefully within uh, 24 to 48 hours with samples sent both for microbiology, uh, with molecular testing and as well as histopathology. So just to uh, a little bit about how, you know, the PCR uh, SARS-CoV-2 test was uh, verified or what we took as positive. And these guidelines were from the CDC diagnostic guidelines at the time. Uh, and I believe they haven't changed. Uh, so 
uh, whenever uh, you know a test was uh, SARS-CoV-2 would be positive if on the N1 and N2 targets of the nucleoside capsid gene you had a CT value of 40 or less. And then depending on the viral load, you know, it could be less, far less than 40 and closer to 40 would probably be when your viral load is not as, as high. And then when results um, had, when your, your uh, test came back with just one or two, N1 or N2 with, uh, with a value less than 40, then it was indeterminate and then you would need to repeat the test. But if you had an end, if you had two tests, two separate tests that were indeterminate, that was deemed to be positive. And then all results, uh, including the indeterminate, the negative, were still interpreted by a, a decode panel for us to determine, you know, SARS-CoV, yes, present, and then are we assigning this baby to be a death due to COVID or not? So after all these things have been, um, all these tests have been done, there is a panel that says uh, to determine the cause of death of the children. So, you know, we don't basically just find the SARS-CoV-2, you know, in the in the nostrils or in the lung, and then then decide yes, it's a COVID death. It's a COVID death. We still go through the clinical notes. So there's a panel that sits, and it's a panel, a multidisciplinary panel that has in it. Um, uh, pediatricians, it has neonatologists, uh, there's also infectious diseases specialists, who's, uh, as well as microbiologists and histopathologists. And, you know, when we, with, uh, the, sometimes we have an obstetrician that comes when, we are do, when we're doing the CHAMP study and when we have stillbirths. But in this setting, it's mainly just the pediatricians, um, microbiologists and histopathologists that sit together to determine the cause of death. We go through the clinical, so for each of the patients, we go through the clinical notes during the admission and all their anti-mortem bloods, blood tests that were done. And we interpret these together with the, all the post-mortem uh, results, which would be, would be your um, nasal swabs. It would be your uh, blood and lung culture, as well as the um, molecular tests from the lung, uh, lung panel, as well as the blood panel, and in, uh, including the histopathological test. And then um, once all of this done and they and how uh, the the deaths are attributed is according to WHO recommended guidelines. And then what you eventually do is you get an immediate cause of death. But before that, you have an underlying cause of death or an underlying condition that starts off the causal pathway to death. And then there may be also on the way to the immediate cause of death, uh, other antecedent medical events that you have to report on that were important or significant uh, in in, in leading to the immediate cause of death. So just as the WHO guidelines recommend, all this data is put together and then these deaths were determined. So this was what was done for these patients. So, you know, in the study period from April to uh, August of last year, the total number of deaths um, of deaths under 14 years of age at Barra was 171. And as you can see, the majority of the deaths that did occur uh, were in um, younger babies, so predominantly in neonates and in young infants. And then MITS was done in 91 of these babies, so that minimally invasive tissue sampling was done in, in a lot of these babies. So this would be then as part of our study or as part of um, the CHEM study uh, that, that is going on at, at Barra as well. Um, so the children that didn't get MITS done were 80 and uh, the reasons range from, you know, parental refusal of consent to children not being resident in Soweto, therefore not being part of the uh, study, not being able to be part of the study and also inability to obtain consent within the allotted time. And then um, of the 91 that did get MITS done on them, uh, 12 were then um, SARS-CoV-2 positive on anti or post-mortem. So, you know, in our manuscript, we also uh, describe the other eight patients on the other side that you can see who didn't get MITS done, but also when they were swabbed, also had a positive SARS-CoV-2 test. So these babies didn't get uh, minimally invasive tissue, sorry, tissue sampling done. Uh, but um, but they also were positive for SARS-CoV-2. So what happened is that the decode panel set with an anti-mortem um, 
results from these babies and that's all they had. And then they came to some conclusion as to the uh, cause of death and uh, did an M&M &M, uh, of sorts for these babies. But for the remainder of this uh, presentation, I'm going to be focusing just on the 12 that did have MITS done. So uh, these 12 uh, patients, they were relatively young. I mean, their mean age was 35 days, um, which I suppose isn't surprising as you can see that the majority of deaths at Vara are young, um, yeah, are in young babies. And then um, all of them uh, were HIV negative, even the two that were born of women living with HIV and eight infants were full term and the rest of them were, were, prem, were, were born prematurely and um, five were hospitalized since birth and thus, you know, I, I had I acquired their SARS-CoV-2 whilst they were in hospital. Uh, the presenting clinical symptomatology amongst these 12 um, so seven of them um, presented with respiratory illness, um, three with a gastroenteritis, and there were three that had seizures, but two of these also had, one had, a, had also had the seizures together with the respiratory illness, and the other had uh, seizures with a gastroenteritis. And all of these babies uh, during their admission were ventilated, uh, were in ICU, and the median time for them being ventilated was four days. Uh, so once, you know, the decode panel set for these 12 babies and went through their clinical, their anti-mortem bloods, and also the post-mortem uh, findings, they attributed death in 11 of the 12 of these babies. So death, they attributed death to COVID-19 to 11 of these 12 babies. And um, I mentioned that, you know, according to the WHO, you have to give either, you know, you have to start with giving an underlying cause of death, and then you give a... Um, uh, immediate cause of death at the end and then you know leading to that you can have other antecedent causes um, in, in that and then when it came to these uh, 11 that were attributed uh, COVID-19 COVID-19 uh, COVID was the underlying cause of death the decode found that COVID-19 was the underlying cause of death in five of them and then uh, only in one did they conclude that it was the ultimate immediate cause of death. So this baby had an underlying familial congenital uh, nephrotic syndrome, but ultimately the immediate cause of death was, was, was uh, uh, COVID-19 in this baby. And then in the other five, uh, COVID-19 was found to be an important antecedent cause of, uh, or cause of death, uh, leading to the immediate cause of death. And, you know, the one baby in whom we didn't find that COVID-19 played a role really in the death uh, was one that had intrauterine hypoxia and, it, and intrauterine hypoxia was found to be both the underlying and immediate cause of death in this, in this baby. And interestingly, in six of the 11, uh, the bacterial infections were attributed to the to, to be the immediate cause of death. So in, in, in five of those in which it was underlying and also in another one, then uh, it was found, you know, there was uh, infections, bacterial, uh, culture confirmed bacterial infections. So in those babies who had uh, COVID-19 attributed as the underlying cause of death, two were directly attributed to multi-organ COVID-19 complications, uh, two, were due to culture confirmed hospital uh, acquired infections forming uh, two of those six that I've mentioned now. And also one infant presented uh, again with concurrent pneumococcal meningitis, uh, serotype 6C, uh, which was attributed as the immediate cause of death. So these three then forming part of that six that I mentioned being culture confirmed sepsis. And then in the other cases where the COVID-19 was attributed as an antecedent illness, um, that's the other five, three were born prematurely. Um, and then in these PREM babies, both of them died. Uh, I mean, two of them died from, again, culture confirmed sepsis, nosocomially acquired abomani, and the other one died from pulmonary hemorrhage. And then the one of the babies had diaphragmatic hernia, uh, who uh, eventually also was found to have COVID-19 as one of the antecedent causes of death. And then the last baby was uh, had um, immediate, cause, immediate cause of death uh, was streptococcus pyogenes sepsis and meningitis. Okay, and then um, 
when it came to the histopath findings then of these babies of the 11 where COVID-19 was you know, included somewhere in the causal pathway of death, features of diffuse alveolar damage were found in uh, six of them, uh, interstitial pneumonitis, um, hyaline membrane formation, fibrin thrombi, and type two pneumocyte proliferation, and then bronchopneumonia in three. So, you know, if you remember, if you think back to that initial slide that I shared about the, the kind of different features that were mentioned in adults, you know, these were similar to those that were, find, well, that were found in the children. When it came to the few liver samples that we had, we only had seven of the 11, uh, excuse me, Hepatic histopathologic changes included submassive necrosis, uh, steatosis, lymph lymphoerythrophagocytosis, as well as cirrhosis. And the heart samples also quite few, like half of the, uh, less than, uh, more, slightly more than half of the, of those with COVID-19 associated um, deaths. And there, uh, the cases um, had in, indeterminate myocarditis in one case and in the other case there was an endocarditis a myocarditis and also fibrin platelet thrombi uh, that was seen and in the wrist um, the lung uh, the, and the heart um, histopathology was unremarkable uh, when it came to the brain tissue as i mentioned we only had four cases of those and these would then be babies also that i said fell in both our study and the CHEMP study and uh, three of those brains also were normal and one had evidence of cerebral abscess and this was the baby that I mentioned earlier who had the strep pyogenes meningitis. So you know uh, I think the study was to our knowledge uh, still the first case series to report on you know findings from um, histopath in children in particular and and, and that being said, it still is a single center study and, you know, that kind of limits what you can infer from, from our findings. But this also, I think, needs to be taken into context with the fact that, you know, globally, there really are few uh, children that die from COVID. So it, it makes it difficult to then, you know, have a, <laughs> have a big study. Um, and... Also, postmortems rarely get done in low-income settings, um, full autopsies, and and I think this minimally invasive uh, sampling was was good, but it also is limited uh, in in you know in how much you can you can say about it because you can't you don't look at all the organs, particularly in our setting because we also focused on the lung, uh, which is what a lot of adult studies have done as well. But when you do that, you do limit you know being able to get a fuller picture of whether this is a you know multi-organ. Um, disease in children or not uh, and then it makes it difficult for you to be able to make those um, observations uh, and then yeah and I mentioned also that we did find some changes in heart and liver but it was few and we can't make any inferences on that so in conclusion um, we know that COVID-19 really causes um, you know, death in children. But I think from our study, we can say that, you know, we've provided compelling clinical and histopathological evidence that COVID-19 deaths do occur in children. And um, our surveillance was for children under 14. And, you know, uh, we found 12 uh, where, you know, we did MITS on and they had positive swaps, but only 11 in 11, once the decode set, did we attribute COVID-19 to those deaths? And as mentioned earlier, they are relatively a young uh, group of children. And, you know, we can't really say why this is. I think one of the reasons really could be that, you know, there are more young deaths that occur at Barra generally. And, uh, but we couldn't really make more of that from this. And also the lung histopathological features that we saw in these children were consistent with those that we have been reported in adults. This kind of strengthened the, you know, the, the reasoning in saying that the deaths were COVID-19 related. And um, also the lung and heart changes had been reported in, in adults were similar to those that we found, but we had very few and it was difficult for us to make a, any conclusions based on that. Um, and the fact that there was so like, over half of, of the 
uh, COVID-19 associated deaths had culture confirmed uh, bacterial sepsis uh, associated with it, you know, it may be that uh, there is a possible uh, causal role of bacterial infections and fatal COVID-19 in children. As I mentioned earlier, in adults, you know, it, it's it's been shown in some studies that those critically ill patients do tend to have co-infections with bacteria. And, you know, it might be the case also in these sick children. And uh, an important uh, part, I think, of the study is that, you know, it highlights how important how you know how useful minimally invasive autopsies or minimally invasive tissue sampling can be um, in in determining causes of deaths, particularly as a result of infections, not just SARS-CoV-2, but other infections as well in children, because it is practical, it is culturally and socially acceptable, and yeah, it makes it easy to able to determine that. And I think that's it. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Th thanks, Fakita. That's re it's really helpful. And as you said, some some really important data that's coming out of um, you know, the unit in your team. Well done. Oh, there's lots of um, uh, questions, questions that are coming in, so I'm going okay. to hit some of them as they come in. So cool. uh, from Dr. Spencer saying, uh, do you think that the absence of maternal antibodies might have been important in the deaths of these children? I suppose particularly the, the very young ones. Um. You know, Prof, we didn't, the thing, the, the thing about um, the, our data is that we tried to go back and get some info on some of the moms. And I think that was probably, you know, something that we, it was a bit of a bummer is that we couldn't always get info on the moms, you know? So we, I mean, we could think, we could assume it, we could, but we, we didn't, because we didn't have so much maternal info, it made it difficult in some of the, babies, because in some of them, we couldn't even tell if the mom had had SARS-CoV-2 or not, because we couldn't trace their, their records. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I, just out of interest, is there, is there good evidence that maternal infection and the transmitted antibodies, you know, either via, you know, entry yeah. or in breast milk, does that protect children? So early on, uh, early on. Oh, so you're not asking about you're asking about maternal. I don't I don't know that uh, I haven't read anything about, you know, maternal um, antibodies protecting babies. But um, in terms of whether, you know, um, vertical transmission does occur. I think early on we thought no, but I think um, as you know, as time goes, there's been some um, case um, series and things that have kind of uh, made it look like yes, you can get um, vertical transmission. That's fascinating. I mean, it's just it is still one of the most striking things of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection that it really does seem to spare the younger age groups. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it's. I don't know that we have the full answer to that at all. I mean, what do, what are your thoughts? I mean, because you're closer to the ground on that question, maybe. As, as yeah, we don't have an answer, Jeremy. That that is just it. We, I mean, there's been a few theories that have been put forward for why it may be so. Um, yeah, ACE receptors. Um, you know, but yeah, we actually and and then some people have said, you know, the fact that African children have probably been Mm, exposed to ACE, to, to, I mean, to previous uh, cor endemic coronaviruses before might be a reason, but to be honest, we actually don't have uh, an answer to that question yet. Yeah, and it, I wonder as well how much of it's, you know, because it does seem to hit the people in, in proportion to their sort of vascular age a lot, you know, if you look at the adult population and, you know, in terms of the cardiovascular risk profiles and age being yes. the two mm. big groups, and, and I wonder if groups. It as well, you know, that, 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 that those are not features, but it's it's odd for respiratory virus to spare children and things like, completely, it, yeah, in such it, a big way. Yeah. As more of horrible as this pandemic's been, imagine if it had been killing, you know, neonates and young children as well. It's been a saving grace, yeah. Um, and and Cesar's on, on the chat saying, uh, making a very good point that the high rate of prematurity in this cohort as well would limit the transplacental transfer of antibodies. So that's, I think that's a, that's a good point too. Mm, it's, it's, it's a, yeah. And um, then Narcisa's asking, do we know what the histopath picture of pneumonia looks like? Any concordance with that of SARS-CoV-2? Narcisa, do you mean oh. pneumonia other oh. than uh, yeah. Uh, what did, what did she, hi, yeah. 
No, I was just asking, um, like there was a high rate of uh, concomitant infections in the, in the patients. So yes. do we know what that histopathological picture looks like just from the literature and so, whether it, there's any concordance with what has been found uh, for the histopathological picture of uh, SARS-CoV-2? So I think the cool thing about, you know, having done this here is that we have also the CHAMPS data you know, and, and, and a lot of the people that sit on the CHAMPS um, G-code panel also said for this. Um, so, we re so we have that data about, you know, the pneumonia and all of that that happened in children before, you know, SARS-CoV-2 in years prior to 2020. And then in the changes, the DAD and the highland uh, formation in older children, you know, that aren't uh, PREMS, you know, all of that that is more seen in in, in SARS-CoV-2. So I think, you know, we can say from, from that, that, you know, these are different findings from what we've seen previously with children presenting with just pneumonia. Yeah, good. Uh, and then uh, one of the other questions coming in about was MISC, you know, MISC. Um, was, do you think any of that could account for some of these findings or are these all, do you, do you think, acute SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, they were all acute and we didn't, of, none of these did we attribute to Miss C. Yeah. None of these children. Okay. Um, and, and then there's a, a question about the submassive necrosis that was seen. Uh, was that, I mean, how many people was that and was it just one? Because that's quite an unusual. I think it, yeah, I think it was one. Uh, and we also didn't get a lot of your liver changes. So, I mean, a liver uh, sample sent, and I think we had only seven of the 11. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I mean, I, I can only concur as well with this, you know, this minimally invasive procedures at the time. I mean, I, I think that we struggle with it in the adult world as well, where they, at least by the state sector, the autopsy time is so long. You know, we, we often yeah. get permission from the family to do an autopsy in principle, but then if they hear it takes one to two weeks, maybe more to get the body back, you know, from uh, then th that is, that's often quite prohibitive. Um, but, you know, as you said, I think that families are often very much more willing to, to permit yeah. an invasive procedure because it doesn't delay the, the It doesn't process. delay the burial, it doesn't, yeah. And yeah, it, we, we seem to get a lot more answers that way. And as you said, surprising how good they can be, especially in infectious diseases, mm. you know, if you're able to target it. Um, mm. And then uh, someone on the chat has, has I'm going to type it into the, uh, into the chat here as well. So there is a, is, uh, someone's just replied about the COVID-19 antibodies and maternal antibodies to, to neonates. So obviously that some of them do get across there. I mean, I guess the question is, um, you know, how much of it is protective in, in the real world? Protective or not, yeah. I, I haven't looked at that article yet. I'm just I'm posting it there for everyone else to see. Um, wow, that's fantastic. I mean, and how how has the feedback been with sort of within within your unit and from your colleagues speaking? Like, I mean, is this, uh, do you think it's it's gone some way to answering some of the questions or at least reassuring that the pathology is fairly similar? I mean, relatively small numbers, but, but still big numbers for pediatrics because, as you say, so few no. people... Yeah, Jeremy, I mean, I, I've presented this to the department, but they were really closely, you know, working together with this. So it wasn't like completely new for most of them. Um, but uh, yeah, we are, we are hoping to get this paper out there and published and yeah. Yep. To... You, I, I know you have some potentially good news on that front, but let's, when it is out. Yeah. No <laughs> yeah, we'll see. It, Say that again. Uh, you know, I said when when it is published, let us know, and we will we'll promote it. I will, I will, I will. Um, and then there's a question from Patrick from Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. and then he, he says, "Do you think that COVID nineteen has come to stay, like other infectious diseases? I, it's not going to go away. What's your sense? Is it going to become endemic, or, or do you think we're going to get rid of it?" I think it's going to become endemic. I think you know, I because of how it spreads, I think. It, it, it's something that's probably going to stay with us and maybe with vaccines and everything we might temper how you know each wave affects us but i think it is something that's most likely going to stay with us i i suspect you're right at least in the medium term of several years at least if not longer as you rightly say uh, but vaccines 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 so let's hope we can move mm. on that front 
All right. I think that's it from 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 the, the questions that have come in. Thank you so much, Fakile. That's really helpful data, and well done on getting some really robust and helpful data from uh, you know from our setting because that's as you say often often we don't have and we have to extrapolate from other countries and also we don't physically a lot of kids in general. So that's really awesome work.